um, where to add comments as we move along so we can collect those as we uh, go through our time together. So feel free to navigate over to that Google Doc. Um, you can add your name, you can talk about what resonated with you, and we can circle back on those um, a little bit later. All right, so this is um, Leading Schools for Deeper Learning. This is lessons from 30 innovative schools. Right before COVID, I had the opportunity to visit 30 innovative deeper learning schools with my writing partners, and it was very um, uh, powerful, to say in the least. So when we start thinking about schools and we start thinking about um, changes in society, we see that changes in schools aren't happening as quickly as changes in society. There's a relevance gap. And lots of folks have written about this relevance gaps, how schools are not being relevant to the needs of society. We want our school, we want our kids to, to be critical thinkers, collaborators, um, communicators, self learners, uh, um, manage their work. These are all skills that we, I think we can all agree on that we want our kids to espouse. These are all skills that we want to espouse, right? So these have to be skills that we really want to impress upon our students. Um, we start seeing these skills come out in what we call graduate profiles. These graduate profiles or a profile of a learner um, are popping up all over the world. So we're seeing these different schools come up with what do we want our learners to be able to do or to be at the end of the learning experience with us. So this one here, you'll see that we want our kids to be resilient learners, problem solvers, knowledgeable, um, balanced, inquiry thinkers, um, uh, personally responsible. Here's another one, it's a little bit more in depth, but what, we, what do we want for 21st century competencies? We start seeing the literature talk about these ideas of competencies and um, uh, 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 abilities versus you know, performances. You'll see, see um, uh, lovely graphics like this. Again, you'll see things like collaboration, ethics, creative innovator, um, positive communicator. Here's another one. Again, we want citizenship. We want critical thinking. Um, we want students to be, be have certain competencies, to be creative, to have a career plan. The, the, this, this school here really loved their C's. You can see they really doubled down on all the C words. Um, but so, so we start looking at all of these. One thing you, you'll probably see that is missing, we don't see that they're doing a, a spot on job with maths, right? Or a great job with history. We have these other skills that make us powerful, empowered human beings, right? No one ever said that just because you got an A on a quadratic formula test, that you're gonna be a, 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 a successful um, human being in the world, right? But these skills over here, we could probably all agree on, yeah, that's what it takes to ex exist in today's world. Um, so as we start thinking about uh, deeper learning in schools, there's, there's four big shifts that we see happening um, in these schools. Higher level thinking, a lot of student agency, a lot of authentic work, and technologies being infused throughout all the work that we do. Um, so there's a couple of questions that really guide this work. So as I um, hit the road and traveled to 30 schools, these questions were really on the top of my mind. Um, as I talk to school leaders, talk to kids, and talk to, um, to teachers alike. Are our graduates really literate? What does it mean to be literate in today's world? Are we taking advantage of new powerful forms of learning? Are our kids really engaged in their learning? We see all kinds of studies when kids just aren't engaged or they're engaged like 10% of their time. That's a lot of time wasted. If you're engaged in a, in a TV show for 10% of the time, I bet you would turn it off. Are our kids really college or career ready? Are we changing fast enough as schools, as leaders, as teachers? And are we paying attention to equity concerns? So these questions really guided um, the work that uh, I, I did with these 30 schools. Um, so we started thinking about these changes. We also have these building blocks of what it means for schools of the future. Um, schools of the future are uh, going to be project inquiry based, competency based, standards based. There's going to be a lot of one to one computing initiatives. Um, things are going to be uh, um, increasingly digital. We're going to be tapping into more open access um, resources. We're seeing more schools do away with textbooks and build their own textbooks because textbooks are pretty darn expensive. And they're also very um, isolating and only those um, countries that can afford them get them. You're seeing a lot more um, online communities of interest, adaptive software and data systems, alter alternative credentialing, flexible scheduling, and redesigning of learning spaces. And you're gonna see that um, with me tonight. 
um, a lot of folks and one of my great writing partners came up with this thing of called the next gen nine, these nine um, learning principles for next generation learning. So next generation learning is another one of those terms that might be akin to deeper learning, if you will, because deeper learning, next generation learning is pretty much all the same stuff. Um, but you'll see that these, these nine tenets are grad having graduate competencies, not, not scoring well on tests, but having these competencies that we just talked about, deeper learning, having student agency, having performance assessments, not tests, but performance assessments. And we'll talk about that here um, as we move through. Having a teaching culture, um, uh, being culturally relevant, um, having access and in inclusivity in our schools, positive and restorative practices, and advising and mentoring. So kids have someone that they know care about, cares about them. So these are called the Next Gen Nine. You can take a look at them. They're from the University of Kentucky Center for Next Generation Leadership. There's all kinds of documents um, on their website that'll give you all kinds of um, uh, insights. So what we do know is that this idea of deeper learning or future ready learning or next generation learning is no longer niche. So I really wanna know how do we lead these big shifts in schools? How are school leaders doing this? How do we initiate and sustain this kind of change? So. These are some books that from my childhood that really resonated with me. John Steinbeck is an American author who hit the road to understand what it's like to, to, to live in rural America. And Jack, Jack, Jack Kerouac was the same thing. He hitchhiked across America. Well, we didn't hitchhike, but we did that, literally hit the road and went on dozens of trips to visit schools and talks to the principals to say, let's talk about deeper learning and what's happening. There are a lot of books out there. Um, you'll see on the bottom right, the bottom uh, left here, like from Jal Maida or Sarah Fine, In Search of Deeper Learning, which is a great book, but it talks about the kids' experiences, right? So what are students doing who are engaging in this kind of work? And same thing, Michael Fullen, he's a, um, a top scholar on this. He's just talking about deeper learning and how it's changing the world, but no one was actually looking at deeper learning from the leader's perspective. So that's what we wanted to do. So those are my co-authors there. Justin's on the left and Scott's in the middle. So we're um, an awesome team that does uh, uh, has fun while we're doing this kind of work. So here are the 30 schools that we visited. Most of them are in the States, granted, but we did actually um, visit schools in um, England, in London. Well, uh, oops, sorry. Um, the American School of, of uh, Bombay. So we were out in India. Um, we visited schools in New Zealand to understand how um, uh, deeper learning is, is looks around the world, but primarily, primarily in the States. And these schools here you're gonna see are a collection of large public schools, maybe smaller charter schools. Charter schools are still public, but they're sort of like a school within a school model here in the United States. So they have a little bit more autonomy to do things differently. Um, you'll see some, some lab schools some, and you'll see schools that are called um, dual credit or dual enrollment, more like an early, early college model where they try to bridge our traditional um, P-12 schools with um, colleges. All right, so we want to share some of the voices of our school leaders that we spent our time with. Um, our research was, was framed around um, this domain. This is an academic bit here. Hit and Tucker, if you're really into the literature, um, they, they did research and looked at every article ever published and tried to say, what do we know that empirically impacts student learning? So they had these five domains. So our work was also situated around these five domains. So we know that if, they're, that if a leader establishes and conveys a vision, that it impacts student learning. Um, that if they establish high quality learning experiences, it impacts student learning. If, they, if leaders build professional capacity, it impacts student learning. If they create a supportive learning environment, it impacts student learning and connecting with external partners uh, impacts student learning. So you're more than welcome to Google that, Hitton Tucker's Domains of the Dimensions of Unified Model. You can find that if you want to be really academic and get into how we, how we situated this. And we had to do it academically because we're university professors, so we had to try to have a, a little bit rigor in our research study. So at the end of this, we came up with what's called a portrait of a deeper learning leader. So these tenets here, these seven tenets, I'm going to go over them individually with you and show you how they were actually enacted in the schools that we visited. Um, one thing that we knew that um, we started our travels at, uh, um, with this school called Parker. So Parker is a, an essential school. So it's in the 70s, there was progressive movement called the Essential Schools Movement in the United States. It was led by Ted Sizer. Um, he wrote the book Horses Compromise, another awesome read if you're interested in equity in schools. Um, but Parker has been doing this deeper learning for about 25 years now. 
So a lot of folks think this deeper learning is all new and fancy and it's, a, it's, just, it's, it's a way out there, but it's not. Some schools have been doing this for 25 years. This school here even has a teacher training um, uh, 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 unit inside the school. So they take local teachers and train them on how to do this kind of deeper learning. This is just a regular school. It's actually nothing fancy. You can see it's just a regular rundown school, if you will. Um, but the deeper learning in there was fascinating. But what we learned there is it's 25 years old. It's all about equity. So it's not special rich kids that get to go there. It's what's called a lottery school. So anybody can put their name in and say, I want to go to this school. And they can get it in. They just pick a number of students they, that they uh, can can um, uh, uh, house that year. It's multi-grade. There are no grade levels. So kids come in and they, they progress through competencies, not grades. So, um, and they, like I said, they, they host the Sizer Teacher Center where they have 12 apprentice teachers come through a year. They have equity fellows to say, how do we build equity for um, learning with these schools? And teachers use the next language, not of achievement, but of what do we need to, to learn next? What do we need to do next? Not, um, you're not performing well on this math test. It's, it's using this next language, always getting the students to think about how do they um, improve on a competency uh, 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 scale. Another thing that we saw with visioning, we saw a lot of awesome purpose-built schools. So this is an elementary school that was a K-3. So this is kids five through um, eight, eight or nine. So a lot of times we, we think about deeper learning, we think about deeper learning in um, uh, higher grades, right? In the secondary, it's not true. Here was a school that was having multi-grade. So the kids were, went together in, in grade K1, um, two, three, and then at, they're moving up later on. So four and five. So the kids were together in those clusters. Um, teachers co-taught. So you're talking about large classrooms. These kids, then, these teachers then had classrooms of 40 because they had two classrooms together and they were doing deeper learning. The tech was super heavy and it's a public elementary. So there's nothing special about this school. It's just like any other public school. But what we saw, the school was built around exhibitions of learning. They had these stands up here where kids were actually in, engaged and did their learning exhibitions up here. One thing we know about deeper learning is all about exhibitions of learning to, and we'll get into that a little bit later, and what, what I mean by that. But this place is all built by exhibitions of learning. Exhibitions of learning is also on the walls as far as what are kids doing. Um, kids were actually making things. Kids here wanted to create a, uh, a farm. So they created, planned, and marketed all of their farming um, in the local school. So they, they took all of their goods here to the local farmer's market and earned money for the school. Um, and here's a, a Studio 5 marketplace. And of course, this is all run by the kids. You'll see here, the kids are super engaged. You don't see teachers working with the kids a lot. The kids are working with kids, which is a pretty powerful practice. And the, the two teachers over here on the right, they're, they're the two teachers for the entire cluster. This is only part of their class. The cl other class is out doing something else. And they're sitting there working and planning and, and helping one another with professional uh, development, right? On how they can improve um, being teachers themselves. Again, you see a lot of doing in these classrooms. And what was interesting here, in, in a lot of public schools you go to, kids are eager to talk to you. But in schools like this, kids are like, I'm busy. I have things to do. I know what I need to get done. I don't have time to talk to you. Talk to the teacher, which was, which was very interesting. So you can see kids are very busy here, all engaged. No one's looking over their shoulder, right? They're doing their own thing. They know what they need to get done. Um, yes, the kids are, 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 are using knives and scissors. Um, this is kind of interesting. This is a uh, grade three. So this is like, I believe, like seven or eight year old kids um, where the school where the community came to the school and said, we need to redesign the, um, the downtown to make it more livable. So they asked third graders to come up with plans on how to redesign that. This is authentic learning, right? Kids proposed and pitched to real people, the community, um, the, 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 the mayor and the, uh, uh, the, the, the commerce center on how to improve their downtown. As, again, it's very tech driven. Kids are all on laptops. And they came up with a, a really engaging, what we call a graduate profile. But this is a graduate profile for fifth graders. They want authentic learning. They want continuous learning. They want kids to be uh, creative. They want them to have design processes. They want to be engaged in the community. They want to equip students um, for future learning. And they, want, they believed in flexible learning spaces and mobile tech. That's what we saw here. These are the things all these kids were doing. They weren't taking tests. They weren't being lectured at, but all of this stuff. 
And all of this stuff is stuff that we want for ourselves. So why don't we want that for our kids as well? So what we learned from this school is that everyone has to be a leader when you're thinking about deeper learning. It can't just be top down. It has to be a collective vision on what this looks, learning experience looks like for kids. Um, the principal has to give up control. Um, we, these principals talked about how there's a process of cleansing of learning how to be a leader because you're often a bureaucratic leader, um, but you're, you, you're not an engaged um, learner and letting your teachers um, do what they need to do. So leadership changes when we're thinking about this kind of learning. And you have to be able to have a story to tell your community. That's what we learned from Epic Elementary. And this school here was an incubator for the entire district. So other schools came in to try to learn from this school to say, hey, how did you do this? And then they took those ideas out to the community to try to change what's happening um, in the community. And schools in neighboring um, states are coming in and saying, talk to us how you're doing problem-based learning for kindergartners, right? And they're like, yes, we've done this. Um, so it's, it's powerful. We also saw that a lot of these schools were open to, to new ideas. Um, the school on the bottom was completely built by teachers and kids as far as what do teachers and kids need in a learning, a brand new learning environment. Um, that's, that's called um, iTech Preparatory School. So uh, again, it's a public school, but this public school was built on the campus of a university. So it gets to tap into all the resources at the university um, when they're thinking about uh, uh, professional development. We see, I saw schools called STEM schools. I don't know if those are popular yet in India, but um, science tech, um, engineering and math. Sometimes we have STEAM schools also, they add arts in there. Um, but we saw a lot of those. So STEAM school Chattanooga was attached to a community college. So kids could literally, so a community college is sort of like between a, uh, a traditional college and high school. So it's sort of like a two-year degree, if you will. Um, but kids can go to a community college for much, much cheaper than they can go to other schools. So they, they might be able to get a uh, two years of college done before they finish high school. Now, that's an important thing for equity as far as a lot of kids can't afford traditional uh, universities, but they can afford community colleges. So if you can get them two years before they're out of college, out of high school, that is powerful. And we saw a lot of schools trying to do that. Um, so right here, they say, well, this is some of the, the uh, uh, quotes from the teachers. So test score wise, even though in a project-based learning environment, you don't necessarily prepare kids to take those tests, but they did really well in those tests. Um, we saw some of these schools growing from 400 to 700 kids, right? So these are big schools. These aren't small schools. Um, they, they continue to do the same kind of ideas that they always had. Um, they just try to figure out how they could expand and do them better. Um, they, they had no gap in learning. And what we saw was actually a reverse gap. What I mean in gap in learning in the States, we worry about gap between genders, gap between race, gap between social economic status, gap between urban and rural. In some of these problem-based learning schools, we see a reverse gap as far as those kids who struggled in traditional schools are actually performing better on traditional measures in these kind of schools. Um, so the reason we do PBL, professional uh, problem-based learning, is that it integrates the how and the what in an instructional strategy that fits our vision. It's all about that vision. Um, and in this school here from Epic, um, the community didn't really know what they wanted. They just wanted something different. And that STEM, STEM, STEM school, um, Chattanooga, they focused on collaboration, critical thinking, innovation. That guided everything. That guided how they evaluated teachers. That guided how they evaluated kids. Um, and that's, again, learning. So it was very powerful. We saw a lot of agency and student learning here. The school is called One Stone. It's in, uh, on the uh, West Coast of the United States. Um, so we all talk about agency, but as school leaders, we're often afraid to give up uh, power and control to kids, right? This school here did. Um, the school is completely student run. Um, Two thirds of the school board is run by the kids. The kids do the taxes. The kids do the hiring. The kids do the enrollment. The kids do the scheduling. So you think, talk about school, a, a student empowerment and student voice, this school here does it. And they came up with this thing called a learning blob. And you'll see, see this over and over again. Hopefully you're starting to see a pattern here. So they want to focus on the mindset of students, on the knowledge base of students, on skills of students, and on creativity. And if you see all these words here, these are all words that we care about. We want our kids to have empathy for other people, right? We want them to be reflective. We want them to fail forward to say, yeah, that didn't work. Now what, what's next? Versus being um, some of our, our, our current kids in traditional schools, if they fail, they're just you know down on the ground crying, right? We don't want that. We want them to get up and try again. 
or skills. You don't see skills here being a, you know, mathematical skills, but you do see critical thinking, which is part of math um, or leadership skills. So all these things around the learning blob, this is how they assess their kids. This is how kids design their learning experiences. And this school here started off small. So it started off as small ideas with this idea called Project Good, which so it actually started off in an apartment. They wanted kids to do service learning in the community, right? And the kids came after school and did service learning to try to change, um, try to change the local community. And then kids said, well, let's do this a little bit more. So they started doing larger community projects. You hear there's different kinds of camps. You'll see there's um, empowerment camps for girls, right? Or book adventure camps or tinker camps, which is a little bit of a STEM thing, right? Um, and then the, this, this uh, initiative said, the kids are really engaged in service. Let's actually engage kids in real world um, um, uh, um, activities, of what they called a, a two birds, which is a creative studio and student led businesses. So kids said, we want to actually do things that, ma that matter. So kids came up with this stuff. Like they designed logos for local, local um, uh, uh, community organizations. They created books. They did logo designs. They created videos for local grocery stores. Um, they created uh, all these other videos for uh, 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 local um, organizations for a profit. So the kids are actually earning money for the school by doing things that they want to do. That's meaningful work, right? Then they said, well, that's, we, lo we love doing that. Let's do this other thing called a solution lab where kids can create their own businesses. So having high school students start their own businesses or workshops around starting their own businesses. That's what happened here. So you see like a youth startup week, um, uh, another startup week here. Um, you'll see um, they had arty parties or startup weekends and teaching kids how to be innovators, teaching kids how to start, start um, um, their own businesses. So these are different initiatives that the founders of this school came up with. So in the end, kids said, I don't want to do this after school. I want to do this all the time. So they took those three ideas and they built an entire school around that. And that's what happens. These kids are innovators. They go out there and work in the community. Um, and it serves as their um, high school um, program. So One Stone, like I said, is totally student-led and student-directed. It's nonprofit. It's not, there's no tuition. It's a school that any kid can go to. Um, it's about empowering kids. Um, they're always living in what we call beta. They're always trying something new. And these something new are always driven by the kids. Um, and when we talk to leader, leadership, they said leadership really is about humility. It's about unlearning and unpacking some of this adult stuff that we've carried into our schools. And you have to get, get kids to fail forward. And that's a real huge challenge. We saw a lot of equity-driven approaches at our schools. So this is a school in um, downtown New York, New York called Ace Academy of, for, for Scholars. This school serves a 99% predominantly minority students. So kids in an area that were traditionally underserved, um, not performing well. This school leader here engaged in problem-based learning and authentic learning in their schools and their kids are flourishing and their kids are empowered and their kids are happy. This school over here on the right is New Village Girls Academy. In the United States, we have a, a lot of problems with um, um, girls who might get pregnant, get kicked out of school or they can't go to school because they have to care for a kid, or they might get um, in trouble with the law. So they, when they come out of um, uh, 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 jail, they have no place to go or go back to school. Or if they're foster kids, nobody seems to, in the States, we have a real problem with foster care and, and continuing that kind of care. And those kids are often moved from home, home to home. And what so, seems to suffer is, is schooling. New Girls Village Academy is all about girls who are in trouble and trying to empower them for their future. So that's all about equity there and trying to empower a disenfranchised group. And that was all about problem-based learning as well. Um, so what we also saw in, in these schools is we have this, do you all have gifted and talented programs? Yes, no. Well, gifted and talented, yeah, for like the smart kids, if you will. What we see in these schools, these deep learning schools, there isn't a gifted and talented program. There isn't a special needs program. All these kids are together. So if a parent comes in and says, yeah, my kid's gifted, can you uh, put them in a program? Like, oh, we can serve their needs, but they won't get a different program. Every kid gets the same program. Every kid gets an individualized program. So like, like gifted and talented, it's easy to do. Same thing with special needs kids. They don't get special programs. They're in there with the regular kids, right? And we try to meet them on their level. You individualize all of their assessment. 
Um, and we see here that leaders talked about they need to logistically eliminate the type of tracking and structural privilege that we have in school, trying to break that down. Um, and you need to connect kids to the broader community in real and meaningful ways. We saw a lot of work with internships, getting kids out there into the community and doing real things. And you have to really trust kids, despite the broader narrative of society that kids can't be trusted. Once, once we found out in these schools, kids can be trusted. Even at an early age, they can be trusted to design their own learning experiences. And we saw some schools that we, that we wouldn't even say are schools, that these are way out of the norm. So this here is called New View. There's actually 14 New Views, I think, around the world. So it's all about an architectural studio model. So it used to be an after-school model where kids would come and design, uh, like it could be designing clothes or designing buildings or whatnot. And then kids wanted to do this all day. So they tried to build a school around an architectural studio model, which was kind of interesting, but it was way out there. But the whole point here is it's all about doing. It's not about sitting and getting, it's all about doing. So kids are out there in the community doing things for the community. Um, and this is on the uh, campus of MIT in uh, Massachusetts uh, by Harvard. Um, so it, it was a very fascinating model. But what we saw, saw that they were engaging in these studios last three months in duration. So kids had three months, so they had like three three-month experiences in their year. Right. So not that they had, you know, um, nine one hour subjects per year, per, per day. They had three month experiences, which was fascinating. There weren't classes. There were no subjects. There were no schedules and there were no grades. So what we see a lot of these deeper learning schools, there aren't grades. They're competencies. How do we actually meet these competencies? We don't care about grades. We care about can you do it? How well can you do it? And we don't we, we don't get that from A, B or C. Um, so what we see here is uh, one of the biggest challenges in leading these kinds of schools is that they're not a school. So some of these places don't feel like schools, and that's pretty cool. We saw a lot of authenticity in student learning. So here's a lot of schools, as I was talking about earlier, that are trying to link um, our K-12 schooling with what happens next with career and college ready. So we see a lot of schools that are um, uh, uh, that buttress like a community college here. This one over here on the left is called Salt Lake um, uh, Innovations Early College. So the high school was on one wing and the college is on the other. So they would come and take part of their high school classes, uh, a traditional looking classes in the high school. And then they would just walk over to the uh, community college and take their community college classes. And at the end, they all had what we call an associate's degree, which is a two-year degree. So that's half of their bachelor's degree already done for free in school. Um, Bard Early College is a fascinating model. Bard Early College, there's like nine early co Bard colleges around the country. These instructors are actually college instructors, university professors teaching high school kids about liberal arts. So this Bard Early College is, again, attached to another public school. So kids can then come into this early college and get this experience that feels very much like college um, as a ninth grader, which is super duper powerful. And we see other models in the bottom here. Um, so you can see that students can fulfill academic requirements that exceed the, uh, what, what students, students would get in their first year courses at traditional colleges. Um, a lot of our leaders talk about this is the way of the future. We're saving students lots of money and getting an associate's degree for free. And this really helps students in need. And the schools that we went to were like in inner cities in areas where these kids would not go to college traditionally. Um, and a lot of these schools are really doubling down what we call advisory. It's really important that we build relationships with kids. So these schools started with a 90 minute advisory period. Imagine taking 90 minutes out of every day to connect with kids, right? Not academically, but just try to figure out what's going on in their life. What do you need, right? How's, how's the world going? Um, but to talk to kids for 90 minutes a day, that's super duper powerful. Um, and the, these, the schools we went to, they, they did short lectures on a topic rather than an actual course. Um, we also learned is that these leaders have to over communicate change, they have to say this is what we're doing and these are the gains that we're getting from these, because a lot of people when they think about deeper learning they're like, this is just all, all, all too, way too light, or way too flighty, or way too um, uh, not structured rigorous enough. But it is, and you have to actually put that out there. This person down here is Derek. Um, he was in Casco Bay up in Portland, uh, Maine. He actually got run out of one of his schools because he was trying to, to, to engage in deeper learning, and they thought it was way too far, way too out there. When he went to his new school, he did the exact same thing, right? But he said, it's all about communicating change. It's all about how do I talk to my community about what we're doing and why we're doing it, and to show those wins. What are those kids doing that are awesome? Um, so what he did, 
Um, he created an oral history to the local community. Like they created theater pieces about what the kids were learning. So they put on theater in the school about what they were learning to the local environment. They did a lot of environmental fear field work. Kids were out in the community doing work that mattered in the local community about in, in the environment. Um, they had their kids travel to rural Appalachia, which is uh, in the Appalachian Mountains, which is a very impoverished area in the United States. We don't have water, electricity in that area. Most people don't realize that. We do have places in the States that don't have water, electricity. Um, uh, and to, to help build in, uh, build infrastructure. They sent kids to hurricane relief to do surf service learning. And they created projects around this and an oral history project. So kids, so, so that the community can actually see what's happening. They take kids out on one week intensives where kids can actually be with like a musician to learn how to play the guitar or to say, I want to learn how, learn how to snowshoe or I want to um, you know, spend a week in a biomedical firm. So kids get to actually spend a week doing what they're passionate about. And we see, again, a lot of this exhibition of learning. What are they doing? Um, we see them, these schools um, showing to the community that this kind of work matters. These are all the different colleges these kids have gotten into. These are, these are colleges they get into without grades, without transcripts, without courses. And they get into all these high-ranking schools, Yale, Harvard, Boston, um, University of Maine. So it's, the, the, this kind of model does not stop these kids from going on to um, successful uh, uh, schooling. Um, you see here a lot of the, what the school's kids are saying about these, that what they love, they love to find their passion in their work, to celebrate their individuality. Um, and you might say, oh, this is all for rich white kids. It's not. This, the kids was act this school actually had, I think, 25% new refugees in the school. So they're serving a, a wide variety of, of uh, folks. And here's just a poster of one of the, 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 the uh, videos that they put on. So they, one of the students went to Catman to, uh, uh, to uh, I'm sorry, this is a rural area in Maine. And they built a school, oh, I mean, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a play around this and put that on for the local community. Um, so you, what the school leader said, you just can't have unlimited chances for kids slacking off, right? That's what people worry about when you think about deeper learning, that kids aren't going to do anything. So here, the, the leader talked about, we focus on the habits of learning assessment that show who is putting in the work and who is actually slacking. So those competencies really help us understand who's actually doing the work and who's not doing the work, which we can't really capture in traditional grades. Um, and of course, this led us into this portrait of a deeper learning leader. I wanted to share some of the voices of these leaders and what they've actually learned. And here's sort of a little mishmash of those leaders. Again, add some questions over there to the Google Doc. I put that in the chat. So what resonated with you as you start hearing some of these um, voices of the leaders? Um, what's your next questions that you might want to ask them if you had them at the table, right? So again, I'll put that link over here in the chat. Um, so feel free to capture your questions on that Google Doc. You can just claim a, uh, a row and just start asking your questions. Uh, Sonia, I appreciate you already did that. Okay, so we start thinking about a vision. Here's some of the, the quotes that we think about when we think about leading for a vision. This is a school um, in uh, New Orleans. If you know anything about New Orleans, that's where Hurricane Katrina was, where it decimated the entire city about 10 years ago. Um, so Sunny Dawn said, if you know enough what it means to be a coastal city, specifically a coastal city on a Delta plain, you realize that you shouldn't exist as a city. When you say coastal rest restoration, what you're really saying is preparing the future for the community. Right. As such, one of our values is preparing for the future. Our mission statement is educating diverse problem solvers rooted in the community with an environmental and social context. So thinking about how these kids are going to change their local community around these 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 persistent problems of living in a coastal plain that's going to going to flood again. Right. That's a pretty darn big problem. Um, at one school, this is what a kid said. I think it's a whole paradigm shift, like it's a whole new cultural norm. For many kids, we're seen and we're not heard. It's as if we don't have a voice until we're part of the real world. But we are part of the real world. We're living in it with the new technologies and social media and things like that, which give young people a place and a voice and an opinion. I think it's a new generation and we deserve to be heard. It's, we should be heard. I think it's hard for some people to understand that. So as school leaders, how much do we really value listening to kids and letting them have an authentic voice? Not just hearing what they say, but listen to them and acting on what they say and acting on what they want and changing schools based on what they want. Um, another tenet that we came up with is this idea of authenticity and agency in learning, right? Um, Iowa Big is a, another studio model that's really big in Iowa. Um, so one of the founders said, we often hear from our parents, thank you for getting my kid back. We used to ask them what they did at school and they said, ah, nothing. Now we're afraid to ask them because they just won't shut up about the projects. 
They just keep going on and on. We see our kids excited again. They care about learning and they find things that they're going on that makes them tick. How many of us have kids that come home and say, I don't know what I learned at school or it was nothing, it was boring. What if they came home and they wouldn't stop talking about what they were doing, right? Well, think about you. Think about if you're working on a project, like I'm renovating my basement right now. I talk about me putting in a fireplace all the time. I could talk about it for an hour, right? Because I'm passionate about it. I'm learning. I have to watch YouTube videos um, on how to run gas lines, electricity and tile and all that good stuff, right? What if our kids did that too? Uh, this is New Village Girls Academy. I talked about that one where the, where the school, the kids that may be on probation or foster kids. Some of our, our, our girls have told us that this experience is not only educational, but healing. This is a really big deal. I mean, if you have an idea of the context of our school and the many things that our girls have gone through and experienced in the lives what they, with, and what they bring with them, that's probably one of the biggest steps that schools can do is to help a kid heal. And what if schools were built around that, right? Not around just getting kids to you know, practice um, rote memorization, but healing. Um, I, I talked about Derek Pierce up in uh, uh, the East Coast. Our kids come to realize because they feel connected to other adults, and that's another key to deeper learning, that they feel connected to other kids, and they feel the work matters, and they feel excited about what they're doing. We're looking at big issues like income inequality and climate change and racial injustice. Kids pick their own topics. They go really deep under that umbrella. So in here, they pick one of these big social issues, and they build all these skills that we need in life as far as how to you know, do work with numbers, how to think creatively, how to write a narrative. They do those things, but they do them under big social issues. Another issue that we had was another tenant is trusting teachers as creative professionals. Um, at school 21 in London, um, the school leader who started it said, when we started the school, we wanted a dialogic practice in the classroom. And that developed into a dialogic practice in the staff room. So of course, the same thing that's true for staff as of children, which is teachers are often voiceless as part of the educational landscape. The idea of every child finding their voice is now being married with every teacher finding their voice. In your own schools, how much empowerment do, do teachers have to make their own decisions about what happens, or about what they want in the school? Not much. So how do we empower teachers as much as we want to empower kids? Um, another school, Laura said, we want our teachers to move away from the idea that you're a curriculum writer to you're an instructional designer. Right. And some, in some schools around the world, it's your curriculum deliverer. Right. Like they give you a curriculum and you deliver it. Well, how do we change that narrative to you're an instructional designer? You're designing instruction. So you design the instructional experience. You have a million choices to make on a daily basis about what you do and when you do it and how you do it and why. We use data that we collect around students, um, student thinking to inform our instructional decisions moving forward. So they, they reframe who teachers are and the trust they put in teachers. Another tenet is that of a uh, openness to new tools and new approaches to learning. Um, Heidi said, when drones came up and we wanted to do a drone class, we said, yeah, let's do a drone class. Um, when teacher said, I have an interest in this. I think I could teach engineering around solar heater, uh, water, water heaters. What do you think? Again, this is teachers coming up with ideas on how to re reframe their um, instruction. The school leader said, sure, do it. Um, you have to be able to let, let a lot of things go and you have to have failures. We definitely tried things that didn't work and you say, yep, that didn't work, but you don't beat yourself up. You just move on and just do something else, right? Um, you have to find a balance with your staff so that they trust you so that with the school leaders, they're okay with you failing as teachers, as long as you're trying to fail forward. And what did I learn from that, right? Don't beat yourself up. That's what life is like and trying to, to impress that upon our kids as well. We talked a little bit about my STEAM, STEAM um, uh, Academy Chattanooga. Tony said, we don't, if, if we talk about the schedule, we say, well, if we want our kids to learn critical thinking, collaboration, and innovation, their schedule can't be just built by a bunch of adults and handed to them, right? The kids have to be involved in the decision-making process, including choosing and building their schedule. At this school here, kids created their entire policy around everything, around schedules, around breaks, around restrooms, around discipline. They let the kids develop all of those. And Tony said, sometimes are they bad, bad policies? Yes. But what happens is the kids realize they're bad policies and then they vote to change them. So this is another place where it's all school student run as well. Um, this idea, again, with another tenet of over communicating change. Um, with Epic Elementary, we invited all our stakeholders into the community, including the council people, the business people, students and staff when they started this school to talk about what they wanted for this school. Um, they start off saying stuff like, we want our kids to collaborate. We want our kids to out in the community. We want our kids to educate, to, be, to do education differently. From that point on in the community, we knew that, we, that, the, that they had their backing and they were ready to blow up education and what it really looked like. So here, when they started a new school, they had to get the backing of the local communities to do something different. 
Um, Christina said, um, the secret to transforming what, what that, that transformed our community, they did the first demonstration of learning. Again, all these schools did what they called demonstration of learning, where kids would actually demonstrate what they're learning to an authentic audience. Um, we see that all around the world. Um, we call, also call it exhibitions. So if you Google that, you'll see that too. Um, so once people started to see what these kids were doing, it was all over. The argument was all over. It was like, oh, I got it. I want my kids doing that kind of work, right? When you have parent-teacher conferences, oftentimes, traditionally in schools, they give you your, your, uh, your, your, a stack of work that you did well on or you didn't do well on that's all marked up with red. That doesn't tell a parent anything. But if a kid is actually going up there and actually giving an exhibition of what did they learn and how do they apply that, that's a lot more powerful to a community member. Um, and again, another tenet is this restless, this idea of being restless, uh, restless, a restlessness towards, towards equity. Um, we saw a restlessness towards equity that was global concern and it was also a local imperative. Um, like I said, we never saw a gifted classroom or a inclusion classroom, a inclusion classroom with special needs kids. And that was a point of pride for these folks. Um, the learning opportunities that, that we, they're all personalized that permitted some kids to accelerate, but they never segregated kids. The, the schools functions as a unified whole where there's a single track of powerful learning that allowed kids to speed up or slow down based on their needs. That's all about equity. And a lot, a lot of our schools were living outside the norm. They were the same, but different. There's a lot of deep, deeply embedded uh, uh, mindsets about schooling and skepticism towards change. Um, the leaders of these deeper learning schools that we saw, they continually iterated even when they failed. They failed forward, that's what we call it, right? They created schools that were different and better. They persisted to develop uh, sustainable models that were all outside the norm. And it took tremendous bravery and tremendous fortitude for them to get that. And again, this built up to what we call a deeper learning leader, a portrait of a deeper learning leader. If you want to hear the stories of these 30 schools, there's our book. You're more than welcome to go out and get that. It's on Amazon. Um, but yeah, we'd love to engage in more conversations about these 30 schools. And what we're doing now is what we call um, a deeper learning detail. We're doing a video cast. If you haven't quite found this free um, uh, uh, organizations called what schools could be, I would urge you to engage in it. Let me I'll put the feed up here real quick. So what schools can be is a free community on thinking about um, how schools can be different. There it is, it's free to join. We have all kinds of uh, free professional development, videos, um, conversations with thought leaders. Um, uh, there's what we call an innovation playlist, but we're doing what we call a deeper learning details where we're interviewing these deeper, these leaders and saying, how did you build a school for equity? Talk to us about where you started. Talk to us about how you failed. Talk to us about who, who you learned from. Talk to us about resources you wanna share. So that's in that community as well. You're more than welcome to watch those videos on your own time. But that's all free. What schools could be, it's an awesome community. All right, any questions or comments? I think we have about 10 more minutes or so. I see some folks were populating things in the Google Doc. Thank you. Yes, we, we were trying to do that. And awesome. uh, from, from what we understood from the presentation that we just saw right now, uh, still, the question that doesn't seem to get out of our mind is how do we implement deeper learning in, in schools with larger population, larger classrooms for that matter, and uh, in schools where uh, teacher autonomy or for that matter, um, uh, trusting teacher to, to go out of the syllabus and uh, you know, create those opportunities, innovative opportunities for, for their learners is not something which is a norm. So, so in that case, you know, how do we crack that? Yeah, large classrooms are never an issue with deeper learning. I mean, the schools in New York, they have 40 kids with one teacher. That's not uncommon. Um, and some of these other, other teachers, like I said, they had 60, 70 kids in one classroom with two teachers. So like a large classroom with deeper learning is not a problem. It's actually easier. So it's easier than what we're traditionally doing with all the grading and all the marking um, and the, uh, the, 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 the lesson planning. It's, it's a totally different paradigm shift. As far as like, where do we start? I would urge you to, most of these leaders, they visited schools that were doing deeper learning or they were watching videos or they, they, had, they were zoomed into these schools of deeper learning to say, how does it look and how did you actually do that? That's why I really urge folks to go to that, what schools can be and watch some of those deeper learning details because as leaders get into, how did I actually start this? Who did I learn from? And they provide all kinds of resources to say, how did I start building a competency-based learning environment versus grades? How did I shift away from that? 
How did we shift away from a schedule? How do we come up with student run schedules, right? They talk about how they did that from all the start from the very beginning. But yeah. it starts with leadership. Yeah, you asked about the teachers. It starts with the leaders. So if the yeah. leaders don't get it, the teachers can't do it, right? So it's talk, start, we, we, I think we often think that we have to focus in the classroom, but we can't because, because teachers don't feel empowered to make those changes until leaders understand how to do that. So it's about empowering and, and working with the leaders to want to do things differently. True. The, the leaders, of course, need to be empowered in order to, uh, yep. you know, to, to change the status quo. That's, that's what sure. we, we call it. That, that's yep. how it should be. Uh, you know, but uh, still, you know, it's, it's very, very challenging to, you know, experience deep learning in, in classrooms out here. Uh, at least, at least, you know, maybe I have that, uh, you know, mindset. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the strategies and, and the learnings that you just shared with us that has thrown upon some light as to how do we do it and how can we actually begin making right. those changes in our classroom. And I think we have also gathered some questions in the document that you just shared. So it would yeah. be wonderful if uh, you, know, you could take those questions as well in order to yeah. make this more clear. Yeah. You ask where to start. Well, first, that what, school, what schools can be, they have an academy where you can run through an entire year of how do you start planning for change in schools for deeper learning. So they, they walk you through all sorts of um, tools and tips and experiences from other folks on how do you do it. So if you want to do the how, the What Schools Academy is one of those things you can do. You can bring an entire school into that academy. Um, the cost is always negotiable. So you can always talk to the leaders and say, hey, this is how much we could actually afford. What can we do with that? So they're all about changing schools, not about making money. So just keep that in mind. So if you want to, and I can connect you with those leaders if you want. Um, yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah, but, it's a, but I'm involved in that academy. So it's like a six, uh, uh, two hour session on how do you actually change schools? How do you plan to change schools for next year? And one of the things we always start with is the easiest thing to start with with deep learning is what we call exhibitions of learning. Just have exhibitions of learning at the end of each of your units. Have kids exhibit to the local community and the parents and to teachers and to their peers what they're learning, right? Not their papers, but show and demonstrate and have them a uh, 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 verbalize what they're learning. That just totally twists everything. Once kids have to actually tell you what they learned, because you're going to start seeing that they, maybe they didn't learn anything, right? Which is a powerful thing for a teacher to realize. You're like, this entire six weeks, you didn't learn anything. That's a problem, right? So um, let's see what we have. How do you assess a fluid curriculum around competencies? So I'd urge you to take a look around. Um, there's lots of competencies online or competencies, uh, 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 a competency gradients, competency scales. Um, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. There are all kinds of things that are out there free. Um, there's a, I think it's called the competency project where there's all kinds of uh, rubrics that are already out there free for you. Um, I can share some resources um, later if you like. Um, same thing with the habits of, of, of learning. Like we want people to be critically thinking, right? So how do I assess critical thinking? A lot of folks have already done this work for you. So you're more than welcome. In a lot of these schools that we saw, they learned from other folks. They said, other folks have this entire curriculum out there on um, assessing competencies. Let's take a look at that and say, does that fit what we want or do we need to modify that, right? So I'd urge you to start looking at how other folks are doing that. Um, uh, what are the learning progressions of disciplines? Well, well, what we see in these deeper learnings, they don't, they don't look at disciplines. You get away from this idea of English, math, history, reading, writing, and they look at education as a whole. So they're assessing competencies, not skills within a discipline. Sure, they might have to teach certain things like you know, how to do a quadratic formula, but there are many lessons. They're not entire disciplines that kids are going to every day. It's in authentic learning experiences. Um, how can we analyze the context of the schooling? Um, I'm not sure what you're trying to get at with that question. Um, was that Elena? Your other question is, how can we collect evidence and analyze it throughout the process? Well, that goes on those competencies. Like, how do you measure critical thinking? How do you measure empathy? How do you measure grit? How do you measure um, intercultural competencies? A lot of folks have already come up with scales and rubrics on how you would do that. But I think what you need to start off when you think about deeper learning is what do you want kids to be able to do at the end of their, their, their experience? Who do you want them to be, right? And I, my guess is when you start asking that self, well, ask that self at your own kid first, 
right? At the end of their school experience, what kind of person do you want them to be, right? You want them to be a good communicator, right? You want them to have empathy. You want them to be um, forward thinking. You want them to have grit. You want them to be globally minded, right? You want them to have passion. Never once do we say, well, I want them to be able to write a 50 page essay on you know, the, uh, the war of 1812, <laughs> right? No, you want them to be able to critically analyze what happened in the past to understand how it's, impl how it's influencing what's happening in the present, those kind of things, right? And then that's where you would work backwards. Um, someone said in, in India, early marriage uh, of, of girls is still a big, big issue. How can we help? Well, remember that one school up in Casco Bay where they focused their curriculum around big issues. Have kids investigate those issues, right? Yeah, that's a big social problem. Let them come up with, with ways to solve it, right? We, we can't solve all these problems that kids are going to be thrown into and have to solve in 10 years, right? Let them come up with it right now, right? And they should be going deep into these kind of questions, these problems right now. Um, how do we make a change for parents who give stress, uh, to, who stress that their kids give their best? There's no second chance. Uh, I, th I think that idea, um, I think that's coming um, from Shilpa about uh, second chances, is how do we build a school that failing is the norm, right? I think we have to have school leaders who are okay with, with teachers trying things that they're not comfortable with and let, letting kids see that adults can fail and we don't get torn down because of it, right? Or if you don't perform well on it, on whatever it is, that you can improve just where it's is trying to step back and understand what you didn't do well on, right? And having kids be critical self-reflectors and say, oh, what I didn't really do well on, even though it might be a traditional math test, but I didn't do well with my, my study skills. I know I need to actually set time out and actually plan my calendar out to do a better job of that. That's a life skill, right? Where kids can actually say, why didn't I perform well on here, right? And we do that in real life all the time, right? To say, okay, if I'm I'm, I do a lot of house chores here. So if I'm like, okay, I was tiling my bathroom. Why didn't I do well with this line? It didn't quite come out straight. Why? Okay, because I didn't do this or this or this. Well, next time I want to improve on that as I start doing the same project. So we do this, we should be doing the same thing with our kids. How can this happiness be spread? When you start going into some of these schools and you start seeing how happy and how empowered kids are, you would, you would, you would, there's no going back right? You don't want kids to just be sitting there and with bored being talked at. You want them to be engaged in their learning. And once you start seeing these schools, you're like, this is the kind of stuff that we want. This is real life. And we don't want to be breaking our kids down by saying that tests matter or grades matter when they don't. In the real world, they don't matter, right? Once you get out of high school, if you got a, a, an A on a test, it doesn't matter, right? And a lot of these schools, the kids are getting in without having a single A. They don't have a transcript, a traditional transcript, that is. They do have a transcript. There are different transcript models out there, right? So, and they're going into Harvard, Yale, Brown, right? London School of Economics. So they're getting into these powerful schools without these grades. So it's a, it's a shift that's happening in society. Uh, well, we have more. You all did a good job of capturing questions. Good job. Um, how do we start each day um, where it's a subject to be included in the subject of PBL, hands-on learning? There are all kinds of lessons out there on the internet on PBL. So feel free to start looking at some of those and say, here's an actual lesson that someone has done. What we often urge schools to do is don't design your own PBL lesson because they're very hard to do, right? Someone else has done it for you. So start off with one that's out there and try to find all the resources that are out there. Versus, and later on, you can develop your own PBL lesson, but it's very challenging if you don't have a lot of guidance on how you're going to do it. But anyway, there's lots of folks, lots of resources out there. Um, you love to connect to understand how deeper learning happens in early and three, three to eight. I'd urge you to look up Epic Elementary. I'll put it in the um, uh, chat. Epic Elementary, um, Ace Academy of Scholars. So if you just Google those, you'll see how folks are doing this in early ages, um, early grades. So a lot of us don't think we can do it in early grades, but we really can. Um, and a lot of folks are doing a great job at that. Um, how much focus to be given to the curriculum? I suppose you need to decide what curriculum you're referring to, right? So if you think about problem-based learning, sure, you're doing things like learning about um, uh, history or learning how to write, 
all that is in there, but it's in it, you're learning it in authentic ways, right? So trying to trying it's trying to reflip what is a curriculum and what should be taught and how do we how do we teach that through authentic learning and authentic voice versus telling students what to learn? I think I went through most of the questions there. Rocky, I, I think, yes. unless I missed anything there. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for patiently answering those questions. And uh, Yeah, you're welcome. Yep. I think uh, uh, today's session has uh, given us a lot of insight uh, to actually reflect and also uh, reflect upon, you know, what kind of school is it that, that we're looking at and what kind of learners are we looking at producing at the end? So your question about, you know, what do we want our kids to become? Uh, I think that is something that we all school leaders and educators need to reflect back upon because all that we seem to be doing is, uh, uh, you know, we, we kind of uh, focus so much on the academic content that, uh, of course, we do a lot of PBL, we do inquiry-based learning, we, we, we incorporate project-based learning, we incorporate critical thinking in our lesson plans, we incorporate all of those. And we've seen some wonderful uh, work happening out there in majority of the schools out here. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the end of the day, of course, you know, uh, the, the parental pressure, you know, on, on, on children and also the pressure of grades on the children, I think somewhere... Uh, you know, we, we kind of lose out on what actually should be the purpose of schooling. And uh, that is like a chicken and egg uh, question, I would say, because uh, For sure. you know, mm -hmm. we're not, we, we, we just don't know, you know, how do you get out of that? But uh, yes, uh, we, we've got a lot of thoughts to ponder upon. And what I would like to do at this moment is uh, if, if you would allow us, uh, you know, two more minutes, I would like to uh, unmute my participants. And in case anyone would like to ask a question to, to Dr. Jason, would uh, is that okay? Can I do that? Sure. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your permission. So I'm just going to uh, have another two minutes. I'm going to have everyone to unmute themselves. Please raise your hands in case you have a question. And, uh, you know, without taking much time, uh, if there is something that can be answered uh, out of today's session, then yes, I'm just going to look at the hands that are raised first and then unmute yourself. I'll, I'll unmute. Yes, just, just me. I'm just going to. Thanks, Rocky. Um, so, Jason, hi. Thank you for a very, very, very interesting uh, uh, aspects of deeper learning. You know, seeing all these examples has really motivated me. Uh, myself and my colleague Neeti, uh, we are starting a early childhood uh, school. You know, and uh, how do I? Can you share some experience how we can use this deeper learning in early childhood? Maybe the age group of three to eight. Yeah, what I urge you to start, um, Jasmine, is look at other schools that are doing this for inspiration, right? And and see what you can model or what you can pull from. What we learn from all of these schools is these schools just didn't create them out of thin air, right? They went to other schools and say, how are you doing this? So like I put in the chat, I think, um, check out Epic Elementary. They have lots of videos on what that looks like, right? Try to see if you can spend some time with those schools virtually, right? With those, with those leaders to just to understand what does it look like? So I think sometimes it's very hard for us, especially in early years, right? Like what, how does this look for three-year-olds, right? Or for a grade three or your early childhood, yes, or three-year-olds. Um, but seeing what other people have done and say, okay, I don't like that, but I love this. So when I'm starting to think about this experience, I want to do this. So then you can, you know, double down on how did you do this over here? Like, how did you get three-year-olds to do exhibitions of learning, right? So talk to me about that. And I want to infuse that in my school. Because when you're trying to think about changing schools, you can't do it all. So in our book, we talk a little bit about what we call um, startup schools and transitioning schools. The challenges are different. If you have a school already with, with kids that do things, learning a certain way and teachers that do things a certain way and leaders that do things a certain way, that's a whole different cha challenge versus I'm going to create a whole new school with 50 kids, right? Where you can dream big, right? So in our, in our book, we talk about those different, uh, those different models, right? So you probably want to look at a school that's transitioning, right? That started off as a traditional school and then did some of these things, but don't lose track of those dreams of those startup schools that are doing really awesome things 
and just say, how can I actually do that? Right? Like, how do I do competency based learning for um, eighth grade, eighth graders or eight year olds? Right? So look at other schools that are doing that and try to see what you can learn from them. And then you start, that's where you come up with that vision. You have to have a vision for what this looks like. Because a lot of times we don't have that vision, right? And, and that's not a bad thing. It's not saying that you're not creative or that, you're, that you don't know what you're doing. It just means that you, you haven't been exposed to what's possible yet. So expose yourself to what's out there first and then start coming up with that vision on what do you think that this kind of school experience could look like. Is there any other, uh, other than the epic uh, elementary, is there any other link that you could look at? You know, look at. Uh, yeah. Um, let me look real quick. I could just give you some other schools. We went to a few different primary schools. We did try to um, uh, balance it between primary, secondary, middle schools so that we had examples of um, all of these. Um, trying to look at my other list here. Sorry, pulling this back up. Another one that we went to, another school is called Winton Woods. That's in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. I'll put that in the chat here. That was another problem-based learning. That was a K through three class. Mm -hmm. um, and also another one called CICS West Belden, Belden in Chicago. Thanks a lot and a wonderful session. Thanks, Rocky. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you for your question. And uh, I think, uh, you know, what also uh, requires uh, to be done right right now, you know, the, the need that I felt could be out here is that if school leaders could be open enough and share what they are doing well in their schools, you know, because every school is doing well in some area or the other and implementing it, it, it to the T. So if you know schools would be open to share that, hey, we are practicing this, and you know we are open to share our learning. I think that would create a wonderful uh, kind of learning environment. So I think uh, you know this is something that uh, you know I'm going to take this up, and I'm going to look into schools that are actually willing to share their experience, and they are willing to allow others to come in and learn from them. So I think this is something that uh, you know I'm going to be next venturing into because I think that's the need where uh, just like teachers help teachers where we actually you know encourage educators to share from one share with one another whatever they have used and has worked for them so I think it's it's high time that school leaders to do the same for the betterment of the entire community so let's let's focus on that as well and, and that's, uh, that's, yes, that's a great point Rocky that's a great point and, and that these leaders here they are all about sharing they are all about spending time with other folks to say, this is how we do it. What we see in these deeper learning schools is these leaders don't, don't, aren't running schools like traditional principals. Like these schools run themselves after a while. And these principals then are then showing you what the great work that's happening. And you know how they do that? They let the kids tell you. So a lot of these times, we didn't take tours of the schools from the, from the, from the adults. The kids gave us the tours to say, this is how our schooling works. This is how that we do this, this over here. But my point is, is that these schools are passionate about changing schools, about changing schooling, and they're super duper excited to share what's happening with them. So if you reached out to them and said, hey, can we spend an hour and learn from you? Most of these folks would say, yes, when? So yeah. there's no fee. Nobody wants to charge a fee. We want to change schooling. We want to change the experience for kids, right? We want to prepare kids for the world that's out there, not necessarily the world that it was, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So I think I'm, I'm going to you know, catch hold of uh, school leaders and I'm going to start this project of yeah. uh, learning and sharing uh, with the school leaders as well, apart from the learning and sharing that happens uh, within the community. So this is something that needs to be taken up, uh, you know. So great. Uh, I think it's 8.10 and uh, I, I will not take much time. So uh, we do have one question, but I think Sonia has uh, raised her hand. Uh, so do you think, can we take Sonia's question or do we? Yep, okay, great, thank you. You've been really kind. So Sonia, I'm just gonna unmute you and if quickly you could ask your question. Yeah, go ahead, Sonia. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, Richard and Dr. Jason, sorry. Yeah, lots of ideas you've thrown in there. Uh, got us thinking. Um, I'm I'm just thinking about 
how does one begin um, the, the fact that there is a curriculum, the fact that there is a learning progression, the fact that we have grades and um, um, every year um, our, our children will move from grade three to grade four and you know th there are certain expectations to be finished at, at, at a certain level, right? Uh, yes. So th this is the way the structure works now. Uh, trying to do, it, 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 so you know, so making, trying to make change in any one area, whether it's to do with a grade three curriculum or, or an assessment, it throws everything off gear, right? Because then the grade four teacher will say, but, but you know, your children haven't got these concepts. Now I'll have to see, teach the grade three program. So it, it's, it's about, I mean, I don't know. I hope you understand what I'm saying is it's like yeah. throwing everybody off the, of gear. Yeah, so so I, I urge folks, you, you can't get rid of your current system completely yet, right? So you, you have to marry the current system with what your your ideal system. So yeah, you're going to still give grades. You're, you're, it's hard to get away from grades um, until policymakers change those things, right? That's, a, that's a, a long burn, if you will, a slow burn, as far as it's going to take us a while to change some of those things. Um, in the States, we have a little bit more... Um, we're a little bit more privileged as far as things happen at the state level than they also happen at the local level. So we have a lot more power to, to change things ish, if you will. But what I would urge you to do, um, Sonia, is, is think about, okay, can we implement competency-based learning as well as grades? So you can have two transcripts. That's what we see some schools do. They have a competency-based transcript and then they have their traditional transcript, right? But the competency-based transcripts gives you the language that you want to use to talk about learning, right? How did they progress on critical thinking? And how do you measure critical thinking, right? And sure, then you're going to say, okay, then over here on English, you've got an A because you can't write an outline, right? So you have those two conversations going on at once. But once you start thinking about competencies, it gives you the language that you want to start using in those conversations with kids and parents, right? or else you're not on the same page as far as what do we mean by grit? What do we mean by empathy? What do we mean by analytical thinking, right? And sure, mm -hmm. some of those things can be measured, measured in the traditional way. Say analytical thinking, okay, you have this, um, this artifact over here where you did analytical thinking by coming up with logic puzzles or whatever else, right? You start marrying those two, but the, the competencies and you start thinking about competency-based um, assessment that gives you that language that the whole school can start using to start thinking about how you want to shift things. But you're going to be doing it in tandem. And lots of schools do, because we still exist in this system that's cruddy to the most part, as far as grades. Grades aren't an, actual, actual, act, an accurate reflection of anything. We know that, right? Or standardized tests aren't reflective, an accurate predictor of anything, but we still do it. Right. So until we, it's going to take a long time to get rid of those things, uh, Sonia, but think about those things that you really want to start doing now, which might be competencies, or think about that graduate profile. What do they want to look like um, at the end of their schooling experience? So it's about balancing those two. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank yeah, you. you're welcome. I know that's unsatisfactory, but I, I don't have the authority to blow up systems yet. No, we are that. I think you've been really patient with us. And uh, I think, uh, you know, what also out of Sonia's question, what I could gather is uh, that, you know, uh, if we could implement even one thing, you know, uh, into our curriculum and uh, adapt it uh, for that matter, I think that's also yes. enough. So, yeah. so rather than, you know, looking at the larger picture, if we were to look and focus at just one thing, doing one thing at a time, and yeah. maybe just for the six, first six months, we're focusing on maybe critical thinking or maybe we're just yes. focusing competency-based yep. learning or project-based learning, whatever it could be. I think yes. uh, if we incorporate those small, uh, you know, chunks rather than looking at the larger ones, so maybe, you know, things can work around with the limitations yes. that, that you know, we all have and we all face. So that's what uh, came across. So uh, yes. great, it's, it's really been a wonderful session and that's, that's been wonderful sharing. And uh, the questions have made it all the more clear for all of us to understand, uh, you know, how, how do we get back into a classroom now and what should be the focus, uh, you know, be like. And uh, as you rightly said, there are loads and loads of resources available. And uh, also collaboration is the key, you know, where yes. uh, if you want to learn something, go out there, ask a question, you know, get in touch. 
uh, with with the, the school leaders that are doing something and they're doing exceptionally well and in in majority of the cases they would be willing to share so uh, let's do that let's let's uh, have a change in our own mindset let's uh, let's be open to sharing and learning from one another and that's how i think we will be able to bring about a change and with this i i would really really like to thank you for uh, you know sharing your value time with us early in the morning and uh, you know enriching us with these ideas it was a pleasure i appreciate it i thought it was an awesome group so thank you all for being so interactive and participating on the uh uh the google doc and in the chat so Absolutely. i appreciate that and feel free to reach out if you all have any questions or want to keep continuing the conversation Yes, absolutely. In case I get some more questions, I'm going to uh, email it out to you. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to probably, uh, you know, trouble you for another session, maybe once uh, you give us uh, some time later in Jan or Feb. Yeah. Sure, you bet. Cool. And you can always right. hit me up on Twitter as well if you're over there on social media, or I gave you my email absolutely. there earlier too. So. Yeah. Great. Thank right. you. Thank you once again. Thank you to all our audience. Uh, you're very for- welcome. Uh, bearing all the technical glitches and uh, apologize we couldn't go live but I have the recording with me so I'm going to be uploading it on our YouTube uh, channel and sharing it with all those who couldn't make it or who were not able to join the room because it was full so yep uh, thank you and we shall uh, see you once again thank you Dr. Jason we shall uh, see you and uh, hopefully uh, sooner yeah okay take care appreciate you thank you all bye